Okay. It should be recording. It says it's recording. Welcome everybody to the buyer's documents class. So it's buyer's forms, things that what you typically would use when you're working with a buyer. The forms changed July 1st of 2018. We actually did not get them until the very end of July. So we've been using 2017 forms for a little bit of that time. What happens is every year, the state association of realtors changes the forms based on any legal change that the real estate commission has done or the legislature did. So with those changes in the forms, they modify things. So these forms will be the ones that we'll be using throughout this year until the end of June of 2019. Is there any guarantee that they will change every change? year? Yeah. Well, every year there's a potential that they'll change. Yeah. And every year they do change because on the very bottom they'll say 2018, they'll change it to 2019. Okay. That's the only thing that they'll do. So if there's substantial changes, we'll know about them. If there are minimal changes, it'll still show that there's been some changes. They'll all say the year. So always make sure whenever you're working with the buyer or seller, with the buyer, make sure you have the most recent forms. If you're working with the seller, and somebody sends you a contract, make sure it's on the most recent form. We had one just the other day where people submitted an offer on a property using year, last year's forms, not this one differences well you'll see as we go through there's a difference with the inspection contingency how, how that's handled so we always want to make sure you're using the most recent form hey doug i can hear you you might want to mute your mic i couldn't hear you but i could hear you if you know what i mean all right okay so for those that are out there i don't have the documents sent to you but i can get those to you Afterwards, if you like, if we just, you're able to see the screen, we'll just change that. Agency disclosure brochure. The Real Estate Commission made minor changes to this particular form. It talks about uh, being a customer and client, and you're supposed to give this to the people at their first substantial business contact. The one thing to keep in mind is here on page two, they talked about the audio video surveillance right here. It's been determined that when a buyer goes into a property, they may be recorded. People have handy cams and other things along those lines. So this is the place where it's important to make sure you give this brochure to the buyers to let them know they may be being recorded. When you go to Walmart, you see up in, this, in the parking lot, it has a sign because they're disclosing everybody, you may be under video surveillance. This is the disclaimer as well to buyers. They could be under video surveillance. This particular form, you just have everybody sign at the bottom of it. And here's the instructions to say what to do on that particular form. Lead-based paint disclosure. With your seller, you're going to give this brochure to them if the home was built prior to 1970, what? Eight. Now, I have people say, well, it was built in 1970. It says prior to. Well, that's correct. However, if you have it in 78, it was built in 78, you can still fill out this form. That'd be fine. If you get 50 on the words, it says prior to, and that means 1977. But if it's the year of 78, I'd still fill it out. It's not going to hurt to disclose. If the other office does not have it because they're interpreting it prior to and they don't have one, I just make note in the file that they don't have one. However, if you ever are writing up an offer and you don't have one of these, I met with the EPA director many years ago, and they told me that if you don't have it, have a blank one there and have the initial that you at least talk to the buyers about. And then when you get the one from the seller, you can put those two together. So it shows that you did it prior to the offer, so you're not going to be fined by the government and not disclose it. The other key thing is you're supposed to make sure that you give out that pamphlet to protect your family from what in your home. That is in Instanet. So it's online, and you can email it to them. That way it shows proof that you've sent it to them. That's very important. Now on this page, it has the agent's acknowledgments. If you're working with the seller, you've informed the seller of his or her rights and responsibilities. So you would initial that and sign it. And then as a buyer, which we'll talk about tomorrow, 
you would not initially be talking to the seller, but you would sign as the agent working with the buyers. Okay. The seller's property disclosure form. <clears throat> this particular form is required by law in the state of Idaho for all sellers to make a proper disclosure of anything that they know about the property. We do have some people that say, oh, this disclosure is more than what the law says. In the green book for 2018, the law book says there's about eight or nine things that the seller must disclose. The Idaho Realtors, or Idaho Association of Realtors, they're kind of interchangeable for the name, they came out with this four-page form, which has a lot more questions on it, more things that the seller can disclose. There's an argument that people think that, oh, it's worse to disclose more things than less. I tend to believe it's better to disclose more things than not stuff. This helps jog the seller's memory. Oh, yeah, we had a leak in with the boss. Oh, yeah, we did have a problem with that. The more things that you can disclose to the buyer that they are aware of, they're going in with their eyes wide open and purchasing the property, understanding exactly what it is that they're buying. So you can fill out the top part of this form, seller's name, date, property address, and the first three questions, is the property located in an area of city impact adjacent or contiguous to a city limit and thus legally subject to annexation by the city? Then you explain to your seller, here's your choices. Yes, no, do not know where the property is already within city limits. Many times the property is already within city limits, so they can just mark that. Okay? Then you come down to this next section. Built-in vacuum system. Their options are none, not included, working, not working, do not know, and they mark. They don't have that built-in vacuum system. They mark none, not included. Clothes dryer. Sometimes the seller says, oh, it's working, and they mark working. However, they're not planning to leave it. So normally they would mark not included, but sometimes they make the mistake and mark working, even though they're not planning to leave it. And the purchase and sell agreement was changed this year. So it shows that sometimes things on the property disclosure form or in the MLS may not be included in the purchase and sell agreement. So this is not a document saying that these things are included. Okay? So keep that in mind. Did that answer your question? No, a built-in vacuum system. I had a house that uh, uh, there was no motor. It was just gets plumbed in. It was plumbed in, so it had the plumbing for it, but it didn't have the, the actual they vacuum. never did buy the actual motor. So would you put that as not working, and then you say no motor in the remarks would be good enough? I would. That would be great because I would just say it's plumbed for yeah. or prepared for this. It's still missing the actual uh, anchor, whatever it's called. Whatever it's called, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there. It's, it's plumbed for and ready for, but does not have all the necessary. So the sellers would initial on the bottom of each of these pages, and this year they changed it from the right to the left side because the buyers were on the left, and now they're on the right. So all those different pages, the address on the top, have the seller's initial after they filled it out. And on the last page, you don't have your sellers and fill out this bottom part here. They just do the top part, sellers. And the buyers would sign there. This next section is in a, an amended disclosure form, meaning this was filled out on the 1st of July, and then today something else happened. Instead of filling out a whole brand new form, they could amend their property disclosure and say, oh, we had a big rainstorm, or there was some damage to our roof, or something along those lines that they could disclose here and amend their disclosure. However, if there's a lot of changes or many other things, I would recommend that you change and redo the whole entire disclosure if there's many changes. If there's just one, you can put it here on the amendment. If there's a lot of changes, have your seller fill out a new one. Or, let's say they listed it last year, they took it off the market because they didn't want to do anything. And they said, oh, let's just use the one we had before. You know, it would be better to have a newer one that says, as of this date, this is what we did. Okay? And there's the information that talks about the property disclosure form. Here is the one page for new construction. It's very simple. And that can be up here as well. Now there is an RE25A or something like that, which is an exclusion. Some people may be excluded from filling out the property disclosure form. However, if it's been a rental unit or the people have never lived in it, it's 
not an exclusion. We did have a lawsuit because somebody felt that they were excluded when they could be excluded when they weren't. So I typically will ask if you have the proper disclosure form be filled out with whatever they know. Because they can mark on there, do not know. If they don't know. That would be better versus having some type of a lawsuit that says, oh, the agent told me I didn't have to fill this out. And you, as the agent, made the mistake. If we're still required to make that disclosure. Exclusive right to represent the buyer's representation agreement, R14. On here on the very top, you put down the date, the agent name, and down the buyers. You're retaining me as the broker, the broker tell you when you fill these items. Then what you'll do is you'll select on here what type of properties that they're looking for. So if they're looking for single family homes, residential, you mark that. If they're looking for duplexes, triplexes, that type of stuff, income properties, you can mark that. Commercial, make of land, you kind of have a custom built job you've done or other. Applicable cities. You can narrow your scope of what you're supposed to be looking for here by either putting down the cities or you could put down the counties. Or you could put down those properties listed in the Snake River Multiple Listing Service or those properties listed in the Green Hotel Association of Realtors Multiple Listing Service. It limits your scope. Some agents put all, all, all. Well, that means you're obligated to put things in um, Northern Idaho. You're obligated to put things for them in Boise. That's not really what I think you're plan planning to do. So make sure you limit your scope. Part of your scope could be all three bedroom, two bath properties between this street, this street, this street, this street. Maybe people are trying to be in a certain school district or for their church, they want to stay in a certain area or who knows why. Maybe it's a police officer that has to be within the county or the sheriff or the city limits or something. So you can find out what the limitations are for what the buyers or sellers you want. And we're not going to talk about that today, but on the MLS, you can search by boundary so you can drop a little map and search for properties that are within that. So there's other things you can do to help you be better at the whole thing that was wrong. Terms of agreement, the buyer representation agreement, here and after referred to as agreement, is enforced from, it says from date, it will expire at 11 59 p.m. on another day. So if you're going to have this particular thing, let's see if I can zoom in. There we go. So <clears throat> How long is it typically taking to find properties for a buyer? Any ideas? You hope that you find it within three months, you know, you find something for them. I typically would fill out one of these for six months for a time frame. Because once you've done it, then you can end the agreement, you're done if you want to. But it's always bad if for some reason things change and you need to extend this. Same thing with the listing. The listing, some people say, oh, I'm only gonna do it for three months. Well, I probably would do six months on a listing. And if it's gonna be commercial or land, at least a year on this. Same thing with the buyer. If they're looking for commercial, or if they're looking for land, you might put it down for a longer time frame. Farms, those type of things could take longer. Broker representations and services. The broker and broker's agent representing the buyer are agents of the buyer. It says we're going to search for properties in the listing service. Transaction-related service disclaimer. There are times when a buyer might ask us for our opinion as to who we use for a record, for an inspection, for other things. And we're not forcing them to use that person. We're just saying we've had good experiences with so-and-so. Explain the buyer representation agreement when you're talking about the transaction related service disclaimer. We're not forcing you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, to purchase or not purchase to use this particular person. Okay. Financial information. If we are going to represent a buyer, we need to know their financial stability, their capabilities, their limitations, anything because we are representing them. So sometimes people don't want to share all their finances. If that's the case, then maybe you don't want to represent the buyer. Because if you're representing the buyer, and you're presenting an offer, and you say, these people can do it, the other agent and the sellers are relying upon you because you're their agent, and you are supposed to be able to vouch for, represent, that they can or cannot purchase. So 
So I explain to my buyers, if I have a buyer representation agreement, I need to know everything. I have permission to talk with the electric, and they're going to disclose everything to me. Because I am on your side, and I'm working for you. And if I'm working with the lender, I'll show them that I have permission to know all the things that are going on. And many times they're still hesitant about things because of privacy, but we have permission. So if someone wants to be very private about things and don't want to share with you their finances, maybe you shouldn't represent them. Now, I am I like buyer representation agreements, but I don't think that you should jump to them first thing. The reason I say that is if you're a doctor and you barely got your doctor's license and your medical stuff, and you go out there and you start saying, I'm a foot doctor, I specialize in, in working with people's feet, diet. Well, if you've never done it before, the public expects you to be professional. The law expects you to be professional. They're not going to say, oh, this is the first operation I've ever done. They don't care. If you say that you can do that, you're doing it. So if you're going to represent a buyer and this is your first one, they're holding you to this higher standard. If you make mistakes, you're the one that's liable for it. And you will be the one that will be sued. <clears throat> I will too because I can be for everything. So I would recommend at the very beginning, you may not choose to represent the buyers. You could act like and go through the things, but not have a formal agreement. Many times you don't need to represent a buyer, especially if it's your property that's listed. If your property is the property listed and you're representing the seller, then all of a sudden you get a sign call. This person you've never met, and you say, oh, I'm going to tie him into me by filling out a buyer representation agreement. And now you've just harmed your seller because now you can't negotiate on behalf of the seller because you're representing both parties. Especially in a case like that, I, if someone just says a sign call, I would fill out a buyer representation agreement. I'd write up the offer. If it didn't work here and they wanted to work on something else and I felt comfortable with them, then I could sign up the buyer representation agreement and represent them on purchasing another deal. Okay, Helen Williams teaches a lot about giving the buyer representation. There's pros and cons with that. So just keep in mind you don't have to. It's great too if you want to, but it goes both ways. You're obligated to do certain things, and people can get in trouble because they abandon the buyer, not fulfilling their best interests above your own. Okay? We have the initial that at the bottom of the page. Other potential buyers. The buyer understands that other potential buyers may consider making offers on a purchase through the broker for the same or similar properties. Just because your buyer likes this property you showed them on 123 North Main Street doesn't mean you're going to stop showing other buyers that same property. It's always difficult when you have two different buyers that want to write up an offer on the same property. It's not going to so you have to be very careful. All right. Limits of confidentiality of offers. The buyer understands that an offer submitted to the seller and the terms thereof may not be held confidential by such seller or seller's representative unless such confidentiality is otherwise agreed by the parties. Some people will write the purchase and sell agreement. The seller to keep this confidential and not to disclose to other people. I just laugh at that because they haven't signed it. You know, it's kind of like saying, I really want the I really want fairies or I really want purple pony or whatever. It's, it's a wish. Until you have an agreement signed, there's nothing there. Confidentiality agreement, if you have one signed before you present the offer, then they're obligated to make that things confidential. Putting it in the purchase and sell agreement is not going to make it confidential unless they sign it. Until they sign it. So before that, they can disclose whatever they want. Say, oh, I've got an offer for $150,000. If you can come in above that, I can take your offer. Some offices do that. Feel that they're representing the seller by disclosing everything on the offer. Is it legal? Yes. Is it ethical? It depends. So keep that in mind. That's why it's on here. We do not control what the other party does on the other side of this. Number eight consent to limited dual representation and assigned agency. Here you need to explain to your buyers that they can either be. You can represent them 100% under single agency, which means you will not show them any other Helen Williams properties. Because we're going to represent the buyer with 100%. Or we could talk about limited dual agency and or assigned agency. That means we can show them all properties that are on the market 
Sometimes we might be representing them 100%. Other times we might be representing them in a, in a limited fashion, maybe representing both the buyer and the seller in our office. The signed agents, or you could have the listing and also the buyer so you can do I would recommend the limited dual agency or signed agency. If it is a single agency here, make sure you're not showing other listings from our office. <clears throat> Non-discrimination. <clears throat> Excuse me, we cannot discriminate against anyone for any reason. Severability clause, that's the paragraph that says in the event that one of these paragraphs is deemed to be unenforceable, we sever that paragraph, take it out, and the other paragraphs are still enforceable. <clears throat> Singular and plural. In the event that it says I and it should say we, or it says we and it should say I, we can interchange those. Default attorney's fees in the event that there is a there's litigation or a suit between us and the buyers. Each party will take care of their own attorney's fees and whoever wins may recover expenses from the other party. Earnest money dispute interpleader, we're explaining to the buyers that there may be a time there's a dispute on the earnest money, but they might not get it back. It's an open dispute. I'm sure, the contracts say many things about it, but they can get it back. We still have to have the other party acknowledge that. Anytime money goes into a trust account, all parties to that must sign to have those funds be released. And that's difficult. So always explain to the buyers it's not a guarantee. Oh, if you back out, you get your own money. No. If you back out, you should, as long as you did it with the right contingency, you get your own money back. However, some sellers take a little bit more time because they're disgruntled, they're unhappy, they feel that they've been shortchanged or taken advantage of. So they might not sign that release immediately. It might take them a couple of years. Have people right now that are upset because the party's not releasing their earnest money. They're threatening to sue me, the agent, and everybody. They say, go ahead. I have no responsibility as to that, those actions. I can't force somebody to do something. I'm not the one that's required to release it. It's the other party. So if you want to sue me, go ahead. I'll get dismissed. I feel bad about that because they feel it's my responsibility or yours as the agent. That's not always the case. All right. Page three. Compensation of the broker. Here's where we talk about how you will be compensated. Some people on here will put down whatever's offered in the MLS, or they'll say zero, put all these things down, saying I'm not going to obligate these buyers to have to pay me to get from the seller. If you're filling out a purchase and a listing, if you're filling out a buyer representation agreement, and you're going to do all these things for free. That's not right. Company policy requires you to put down some numbers here. Why? You don't have to collect the whole amount. Let's say that you put down three percent, which is company policy. And they don't have, they're offering two and a half. I think you'd be okay. But you don't have to collect that other half percent. You know, it says you may. But what's bad is when you put down zero on here, and on a for sale by owner, you put down zero, and the buyer chooses a for sale by owner, and now you have all this liability and responsibility and zero compensation. So if you get sued, you still have to defend yourself, but you have no money to help defend yourself from it. So that's why company policy is that we put down 3% on this, and we also put down the cancellation fee. So there's a cancellation fee down on line 250, typically 1% selling price. Or sometimes when you're looking at a price range for these buyers, it doesn't say exactly what price range. So that's why your people might put down $500 or $750 for a cancellation. Do you have to charge that? No. But if you did a lot of work, then yes. Okay. So paragraph A, the property is subject to a listing agreement with the broker's company or a cooperating broker. Listing service. The fee will be equal to the amount offered by the aforementioned broker, but not less than 3% of the selling price. The buyer agrees to pay the broker any difference between the amount received from the aforementioned brokers and the stated minimums. So if it says 3% here and only 25 is offered, we're going to go after that other side to pay our fee first. So we're doing that so the buyer does not have to pay that. But in the event that it's not covered, then we may be able to collect that fee. At closing, B. If the property is not subject to a listing agreement, such as a for sale by owner or a custom build job, the buyer agrees that the 
local will be made a fee of not less than 3% of the selling price or blank to be applied at all. The broker shall first seek to obtain this fee through the transaction made by the seller. You cannot be made to the seller prior to the responsible for such a state of fee. I typically will mark A and B down. If people aren't, are not thinking about poor sell by owners, I still put it down because if they change their mind and we decide to look at a poor sell by owner or we decide to get a job to build a house built for them, I already have that down. If they're not looking to do that, then it's not going to come into effect. I'd still fill out A and B. C is if you're leasing, don't really worry about that retainer fee, don't worry about that hourly fee, you can be paid hourly, you don't have to worry about that. And then there's the cancellation fee, and the cancellation on what you If you have a contract and it takes a little longer to get it done, here the default is 90 days. And then that's the cancellation fee, 148 to 150. The terms and conditions, communication failure of the buyer to reasonably maintain communication with the broker is a breach of this agreement. So if you can't get a hold of your buyer, that's bad. But think about the same thing with you. If they can't get a hold of you, that's a breach too. If you ever go out of town and you don't have coverage, and you're not able to get your reach, you need to let your broker know, hey, I'm out of town, here's how you can get a hold of me. So and so covering you from me. That way, we've got things taken care of. And your voicemail should say, "Please contact so and so who's covering you." You need to let your sellers and buyers know that you're gone. Essential for a short period of time. So and so is helping you out. Okay. Uh, wire transfer warnings. Let's go. What do you mean transfer? We don't want to do that. We don't want to tell people how to transfer the money, etc. Make sure we are going to be involved. Captain the lot which brought 19 authority of signatory. If they're a part of a corporation, a partnership, trust, estate, they need to prove and show that they actually have the authority to represent that entity. So we need copies of those documents. If they don't want to give them to us, they need to provide them to the title company. So the title company, because they're going to need to transfer the title. Merger and time is of the essence of the disagreement. So Buyer sign this, and then you would sign, or the broker would sign, on behalf of the brokerage. Any questions on the buyer representation agreement? Doug, got everything okay? Yep. Okay. Then we're going to spend most of our time on the RE21. There have been a few changes on this particular form. So at the very top, put down the date, the ID number, and in the packet I show you how I kind of came up with the ID number. I put down the date. Month, day, and I put all the one because I thought I'm talking to a thousand of us. And I had plenty of spaces. I never even wanted to put down my initials or something. So whatever you want to do with your ID. Some people have numbered them one, and then the second one, two, and three, to find out how many offers in their lifetime they've written up. You can do that. Whatever thing you choose to do. Listing agency and selling agency. You fill that part out there. And typically don't worry about the emails and Put down the office phone and that kind of stuff. That's about it. I normally don't want my buyers to be calling me the listing side. So sometimes I don't put down the listing side of the phone number for the agent because I need to in the office that they work with, but I might not put down any other kind of information. I'm going to sell the listing side because I don't want my buyers to come. Mm -hmm. Now put down the buyer's names. Now here you need to find out how they're going to take time. It's going to be Michael James Johnston and Shannon P. Johnston, husband and wife. Of course, it's going to be Michael James Johnston, a married man purchasing sold and separate property. I don't know who likes to know. That way they can draft the documents correctly. So if you can put that here, that's better. However, if you just put down Mike Johnston and Shannon Johnston as the buyers, that's not the legal names, and it causes some problems for the lender later on, and possibly how they're going to so always ask your buyers, what's your legal name? How are you going to get the title for this property? Otherwise, they'll have to sign AKAs, also known as documents of closing, that say Mike Johnston and Michael James Johnston, Michael Johnston and Mike, because you know, it's the same person. So if you do it right the first time, you don't have to worry about that. Anyways. 
instead you find your married name buying a property with just your name on it. It's possible to do so. I don't recommend it, but yes, it's possible. But I'm disclosing that I'm married. So we're in a community property state. This property is going to be my sole and separate. Now, legally, my wife were to pay anything or get involved with it, then she could have legal access to that property. But there are times when there's investments that are done, or if the other spouse is not going to be there, so they might just purchase it in one person's name and not the other. Sometimes one spouse has bad credit, so they're going to purchase it in the other spouse's name. So you can disclose a married man but purchasing this in your own name. Okay. Then we put down the legal description. Now, when you're the listing agent, you want to make sure that you put down the right legal description. So many people put in the wrong legal description. I put down uh, 3.2 acres of, or they'll say so many square feet of. Can you draw that out for me? No, you can't. So it's Lot two, lot three, Paradise Acres subdivision. Then you don't need to put the township and range. If it's in a report, if it's a recorded plat, you just put down lot and lot and the subdivision. Okay. You don't need to put all that other stuff. Some people put that in because they saw it on the property profile. Well, the property profile under the legal description, when it shows that, that could be for tax purposes, seeing how big it is, so the normal you know, 0.3 acres or something, how many square feet. Look at the, at the last report of deed of trust. It says what's being transferred, lot two, lot two, or a portion of, starting at this point, it could be longer legal. If that's the case, then you can attach that as an exhibit A and have everybody initial that to be illegal. And on here you say, attach to exhibit A and have it be attached. Okay. Question? Well, this is why the exhibit. That's why you have an exhibit. Paragraph two, purchase price. You write down on the left-hand side, then you write it out as a check on the right-hand side. I'm not going through the forms. Maybe when you use form simplicity or something like that, because they can fill it out for you, which is great. That's one of the class, so I'm just going through what we do. And the other one, which we didn't import it really simply, you can just type in the MLS number and it brings in what's included and excluded and all this other stuff, so you can help you out. That's a good Paragraph three, financial terms, earnest money. You write down, let's say it's $500 for this. Evidence bias, each one of these columns, which is different, each one of these columns you'd select one. Evidence bias, cash, personal check, cashier's check, wire transfer, note, or other. Typically, it's gonna be a personal check. I would recommend that we start getting cashier's checks because then they can be deposited immediately. Idaho is one of the states that we say we're good fun states, but we still accept earnest money as a personal check. Not everybody has checks. You know? So some people have to go get a cashier's check from the bank and make it out to America, I hope the person in America, you know, why it's whatever. So that's that first one. Second one, held by responsible broker, closing company, or other. I see agents clicking other and putting first American or the title company there. No, that's the closing company. Because if they're going to counter and change the closing company, they're going to have to counter and change who's holding the earnest money. So it's easier to just say the closing company and to change where the closing is going to be and change these paragraphs. Delivered with the offer, within blank, business days, three days blank, acceptance or other. Typically, you're going to mark down the second one within three business days. Sometimes you might have the check already. They brought in and gave to you, so you'll deliver that in time. Our office does not hold the earnest money. It's held by the time. I cannot say that I need the check in my office. Well, they can bring it to you, so you can deliver it to the title. Bring it to me. That's one option. Or they can take it directly. I don't really like them taking it directly, because when they get there, the title comes like, what's this for? You know, they don't have a copy of the purchase. And sell it. You send it, you can attach it to a purchase and sell agreement or give them information so they know what to type. If I send all the documents I have, so then I can. And they know what it is and then you put down the transaction on there and they can tell it straight to the title. That's an option. 
Then the last paragraph or last column is deposit upon receipt and acceptance, upon receipt regardless of acceptance or other. The title companies typically are going to do the second one, upon receipt regardless of acceptance. As soon as they get it, they're going to convert it over to gift cards. So I would probably mark that second one. If you're holding it, you can mark down the top one, upon receipt and acceptance, because you're not going to take it to the title company until it's accepted. So it depends on what you can hold. Responsible broker shall be, and it'll always be me, when you're writing it up. I don't like it when the other party writes it up and puts me, because I'm not their broker, as a responsible broker. It happens. But if you ever get that, if they did it that way, and some smaller offices don't understand and they do that, or they say, oh, you're told to do so. I don't want to be responsible for them. I'm happy to be responsible for you, but I don't want to be responsible for you. So if you ever have that down, and it's off on one of our listings, and they have me down, and if you correct it, I mean, does everything on this page need to be the initial? So if I crossed out Mike Johnson and said, who is actually your broker? You know, the initial stuff. and date. However, if you're planning to make a change to the counter offer, then I wouldn't change it on here. Gotcha. I'd use it on the counter. So okay. if you're making other changes to the document, use the counter offer. If, however, that's the only change and you agree to everything else, yeah. then go ahead and cross it off and have your people initial and data, and then get them to initial and data too. Okay, cash offer, yes or no. If it is a cash offer, we'll skip the next section. But typically, they're going to be on some type of finance. Cash proceeds from another sale, yes or no. So they'll ask several times in here. Like up above on line 17, is this offer contingent upon the sale we finance and the closing of any other property? Yes or no? Because it makes a difference. If you say this is a cash offer, oh, by the way, I'm giving you the closing on your property, and it doesn't close, and you say, oh, we said it was cash, and we, don't, we can't get the cash now. Do you think those, sell those sellers were harmed? Yeah, they were, because they took your offer, think it was a cash offer when it really wasn't, and was subject to closing on another property to get. So you make sure that that's disclosed. So cash proceeds from another sale, yes or no, and then the loan proceeds. You have a first and a second loan. Why is that? Many times we've had that they have they have a one loan with eighty percent down, and they get a second loan for fifteen percent and come in with five. That way they don't have to pay uh, mortgage insurance for them. So there's different programs that work that way. So that's why sometimes there's more than one loan. You need to make sure you talk with your lender if there's more than one loan. If you're saying the seller's to pay the doc prep fee, well, doc prep fee for one loan or for two loans. You can add up. Loan origination fee for one loan or for two loans. So you have to disclose if you're getting a first loan, a second loan, or what's going on there. You're asking the seller to pay for the first loan. Mark down the type of loans that are there. Now, if you're going to have if you're not sure if it's a conventional or an FHA loan, always put down the tougher one, the FHA. Because you can always, it says in the fine print, change it to something that would be less costly for the seller. But if you say it's going to be a conventional loan and they accept yours, and one says, oh, we need to go FHA because they're credit, we need to modify it. No, the seller doesn't have to stay in the offer. You can back out. Why? Because an FHA loan requires the property to be at a certain condition. And the seller may be asked to participate with certain costs. And they didn't agree to do that for which. Okay? So it's always best to get your ducks in a row, know what type of financing, you know if there's any closing costs or things that need to be paid for by the seller before you write up an offer. Initials and dates on the bottom. Okay, additional financing. You're going to have them carry. Sometimes you make that's the case. Approximate funds due from buyers to closing, other terms and their conditions. This is where you put things down in the event that it has to happen by the closing. Paragraph four. I've got some examples in there. It's subject to a spouse taking a look at the property. Let's say Nick came here from Boston and one person's looked at it and it's subject to the other spouse coming here and looking at it. 
You ever put down contingencies, put down a date for it. So if I want to work with a seller, I don't want to have an open contingency. If I say subject to so and so approving the property no later than 5 p.m. on such and such a date, I can look at that because that, that takes four days away from now, or it's during their inspection time frame, or something. And I can deal with that versus, oh, it was all the way to closing. They change their mind the day before closing. They've got an out. I don't need to do that. So if you work with the seller, make sure you're protecting your side. If you work with the buyer, make sure you don't leave open any things there that the seller's going to want to counter because they don't know. Put down seller to replace the carpet. Well, they don't have a limit on how much it is, or is it carpet everywhere in the house, or what? Make sure you explain it that if that were the seller and do what they want to. Cost not to exceed X number of dollars, or you have a bid already submitted from XYZ carpet later, and you say seller can pay, pay up to X number of dollars to XYZ carpet later uh, as per the attached bid. That way it's clear. Items included and excluded. In the here, it talks about ranges, ovens, and built in dishwashers. It already says ranges in ovens. So we don't have to add when they're included. Explain that to the buyers and also to the sellers because you're asking for it. If your seller says, Oh, we're planning to take our refrigerator and our oven, and on here it doesn't say anything about it being, uh, uh, being excluded, it's staying. It says so in paragraph five. So please make sure you inform people that that's new as of two years ago. We used to not do fine print now, it says it. Mineral rights, if there's any, water rights, if there's any. Title conveyance, since it's going to be by warranty deed, preliminary title report, provide that to the seller who can read any expired books and something that says six on here. Title company, they agree that so and such and such title company located at Lincoln location shall provide the title policy. Now you can have one company do the title policy in a different place to close it. It's possible. So if you don't change on the counter of who's providing the title report, who the closing agency is, and you just say closing agency be pioneer, and you let First American here. I don't think that was your intent, but that's what the contract says. So please make sure you make changes and change. The next page, standard coverage, it explains that extended policy inspections. Paragraph 10. This is an important one. Buyer chooses to conduct inspections or not to conduct inspections. Even if you're working with a buyer and they say, oh, we don't want to conduct them, I would still mark down that you need to. You give them some time on here. It shows that they've got how many days to conduct their time. Five, I'm in paragraph one, line one is 53. You've got five days to conduct your inspections. It's happened before if you're working with first time home buyers and they say, oh, we, have, we want to save money so we don't want to do an inspection. So they go home and they talk to their parents and everybody and talk about how excited they are. And so they ask me, when are you going to do that inspection? Well, we're not doing one. What? That real estate agent talked you out of doing an inspection? Well, yeah, yeah. They, they'll point the finger at you guys, at us. So it's always better to have that down in case they change their mind to do an inspection. Okay? Now let's assume that they're going to have an inspection. There are two different inspection time frames. The first off page, line 144. If you are writing up an offer and it's subject to a short sell approval, mark that box because the time clock will not start. Right now, the days are based on everybody accepting the offer. On here, it changes. If there's a short sell, the clock doesn't start for the inspections until they have approval. Why would a buyer want to pay for a home inspection on these other inspections, not knowing that they're going to get Okay, so that's what that paragraph is there for. It must be marked. So let's assume it's a regular property. There's not short sale approval. They've got five days to do it. So here's the time frames. One, primary inspection. There's two different or more inspections. Primary and secondary. Primary is just like what we had before. They can go take a look at it. If, if they don't like the way that uh, the sun sets, they can back out. If they don't like the school zone, they can back out. Pretty much for anything. So that's why we try to keep that time frame as short as we can if we need to sell it. So they can conduct their inspection. Okay, that's the first one. The secondary inspection, if you marked it, 
might be for domestic water well. Okay, that first one, water potability and productivity. Potability is to make sure that it's drinkable. Productivity is to make sure that there's plenty of flow and that there's plenty of water coming out. If not here, it shows that it's within 10 business days. We need to modify that data. The number of days. Second, so inspecting and having it be pumped. On here, the default is 10 business days. Third one, survey shall be completed and notice provided within 10 business days. Other inspection can be completed within blank number of days. It could be for uh, electrical inspection, it could be verifying property lines, it could be planning and zoning and landscape, it could be whatever. You can put those things down on here. Now, let's say that you mark the domestic well, the septic, and you have the primary inspection. So you have three different inspections. But it comes back and you use the RE10. We'll talk about that form here after this. You need to mark down that this is a response to the primary inspection or is it a response to the primary and the secondary inspections? So if you have three things requested on the purchase and sell agreement, if you're working with the seller, you need to have all three of those marked off, whether it's with one RE10, two different RE10s, or three different RE10s, because each inspection may have a different form. So you may have multiple RE10s now. It says so in here. The notices might require more than one form. Okay? Now, on this, when you fill out an RE10 and you give that to the seller, saying we would like you to fix the plumbing, and such and such. The seller then either say, yes, we'll do that, or they'll say, no, we won't. If they say, no, we won't, they can come back with an RE10 to you. The only choices you have as a buyer are to accept it, or you can say to the seller that, no, we're not going to do that and terminate the contract. You don't go back and forth three days, three days, three days, three days, which a lot of people do. That's not how the contract reads. If you get to that point, I would verbally talk to the other side and say, hey, you know, we don't agree with that. We really need to have it done. What can we do? And come up to some type of agreement within those three days or the and then have it the sign something. The contract reads, you can either come back to you or to the buyer, you either accept it or terminate the contract. So that's why many people send out a termination agreement, even though they still want to do something, is because the contract says that those are their options. Okay? All right. Lead-based paint disclosure. The property was built prior to what year? 78. 78. And you need to have that. And if you mark it, it is find this target housing, you will require to have one of those forms in the pocket. They can waive the right to test for it, that's what on here, or they can test. Mold disclaimer if they want to test for mold, let them do so. Make sure that they do that. Square footage verification, it's a material fact, you can check that out. Sellers property disclosure form, have they seen it, yes or no? They're supposed to get that provided to them within 10 calendar days after acceptance. So if you already download it from the MLS, and you mark yes on here, that's great, because it proves that you provided it to them. You've met the statute, the law. Covenants, conditions, and restrictions. We are not responsible for CCRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. If they would like those, we can help request them, or they can give them an entitlement. There's been many lawsuits about CCRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions, what they can and can't do for us. We are not to interpret and say, oh, yes, you can have a dog run. Oh, yes, you can park your RV out in front of the house. Or, oh, yeah, you can have such and such type of tree. There's so many restrictions, potential and subdivisions. Some of the restrictions could be the type of fence that they have. It can only be a wooden fence. It can't be a chain link. The height of the fence. Where they can put a building or structure to the back line. Where they can build to it. The type of buildings that they can do or not. They can have a satellite. All these different little things are in the covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Yeah. So, are you saying we're better off just to not say anything? I mean, like, no. The, the, if you, you want they, to give it to them, and if you know some things, you can if say. If you don't, don't know, want to interpret. What if you don't have the? Are you Probably. saying that I should have a copy of the covenants? In the class, one of the test questions was, "What do you do when they send you the preliminary title?" And the test questions were, "Put it in your file." Another one was, "Get a copy of your buyer." type of stuff, you always get a copy. So when they send that copy of the CCNRs, the preliminary title, you have to 
forward that copy to your providers. So they have to. If you have any questions on that, say, hey, first page of this person who can answer these questions. But let's say that you have people that are wanting to buy a property because they want to have their off lighters. Right. You better be looking or at least giving a copy of the restricted covenants to them so they can find out if they can actually have it. My subdivision says I can only have three animals. I couldn't have it, man. Even if it was Rottweilers or not, I can only have three. So you have to be careful. You make the assumption where they come in and buy a property and make all these changes and then they can't do it. And I said, hey, I told my agent. I told him that I needed a property that I could do this. So that's why I'm doing it. Well, you can't. Well, you're now in trouble. We bought a property you can't. Who are they going to sue? Yeah. yeah. So that's why we don't interpret it. And we have to be cautious. So if they say something, that we need to make sure we can do it. Say, I'm not sure about that part. Let's have you call so and so the title company to see if that's, if that's true. What I see, you can say, what I'm seeing here, it says something, there's some restrictions, but well, let's have you contact them. You have them do it, not you. Yes. I need to see what you can really step into. The well, the thing is, we want to assume so many things. We want to take on certain responsibilities. We want to be the answer man. Right. Oh, sure, I'll find out. And then you find out. Well, the way you ask the question, the city officials might answer it a certain way. Yeah, I want to do this, but however, it has this contingency and this and this. I'm the one asking those questions. I might not portray it the same way. I want them to feel totally comfortable. They spoke to them during their inspection time frame and had it approved verbally. We know what they need to do. Because I can say, yeah, it can be done, but you have to file out this form, pay this fee, and do this other stuff. Mold disclaimer, square footage, sales, property disclosure, covenants, conditions, restrictions, subdivision, homeowners association. If there is one, mark that down. Sometimes there is one, but it's not active. Like one of my subdivisions. We're asked to pay $50 a year, but no one's really collecting it. It's not happening. I hate to say that, but it's kind of going to be pumped. So. Cost paid for by whom? The seller agrees to pay up to X number of dollars of money required to repair cost home. Had an agent today call me and says, have a repair list came back on this property. It's FHA. How do I handle this? What do I do? Because there's some repairs that need to be done. So I called this agent back and I said to him, What does it say on the purchase and sell agreement? The seller's responsible to pay up to the first how many dollars? Oh, I put down 500. Well, good. I'm glad you did. So I tried to teach him for something. So the cost is going to be less than $500 to get it done. So there's nothing that they need to do. They just provide this list to the seller because they've already agreed to pay the first $500 of lender required costs from the appraiser, not from the home inspection, from the lender. A lot of people put zero when you this point. If you're going to FHA, you need to put a token number. If you're going to FHA and you know the roof's bad, I'd put down a higher number because they're going to be responsible to take care of the roof. Or in paragraph four, put down seller to replace the roof. So that way it's outside of this cost. If the seller's already agreed to pay for the roof or do this or that, put that down in the other terms and conditions so it doesn't count to anything. All right? Uh, initials on the bottom of the page. Page five. Upon closing, seller agrees to pay blank percent of the purchase price or X number of dollars as a seller concession. So let's keep reading the three. This can be used towards lender approved buyer's closing costs, lender fees, and prepaid costs, which include but are not limited, limited to those items in the buyer's columns marked below. This concession can also be used for any other expenses not related to financing at the buyer's discretion. So if you say it's going to be 3% of the buyer's closing costs and it's a $2,000 property, that's $6,000. Right? So if they have certain closing costs that they have, do you cut it off to just what is permissible? Here, they can ask for anything up to that full $6,000. It used to not read them. It used to say up to, and they could never use the full amount. But now, they could use it to pay something off. They could pay off a car, something along that line to 
change their debt ratios. As long as the lender's okay, they can pay money for new carpet. They can pay something to Home Depot. They can pay prepay other stuff. But if you're the listing agent, plan on the full amount being used if you agree to it. Otherwise, have them put a dollar fee. That way, it's limited. If your seller says, "Hey, I don't want to pay up to six thousand dollars. I'm willing to do forty five hundred and counter back and say we're not willing to do the three percent, but we will pay forty five hundred dollars." And I reference the same paragraph on the slide because that way it has the verbiage. Then you mark the different items down. Appraisal fee. I typically will mark that that's a buyer expense. And you'll see it's a seller expense, but it's part of the down state buyer's expense. Appraisal reinspection. I put that down as a seller. If the seller didn't have their property ready to go when the appraiser came out and have to come back again, I think that charge can be given to the seller. Closing escrow fee, share equal. Lender document preparation fee. That's a buyer's cost. However, if I'm not asking them to pay a percentage of closing costs up above, I may mark some of these for the seller to pay. But I'm not going to say pay up to X number of dollars. I'll just say, I'll just mark a couple of these things that they can pay. Or not. But it is a buyer's cost, but many times I'll mark that for the seller. Tax service fee, I mark the seller to pay to make sure that the taxes have been paid on the property, the property taxes. Flood certification tracking fee, I typically will ask the seller to pay that. Lender required inspections. If I'm dealing with an FHA loan, I'm asking the seller to pay for certain things. Attorney contract preparation for review fee, not applicable. Home warranty, I can type that on here. If you're going to do one, let's say that you're going to choose this one. I would put down home warranty. Uh, landmark home warranty, not to exceed $300. That way the seller, if they agree to this, they already know what type to order, because that's what the buyer wants, and the price range. Or if it's going to be the four hundred dollars, whatever you put down, that way they know you're not buying both. You just said home warranty, so the cheapest one possible. That's not what you think. You're doing. So if you're writing this up for your buyers, put down the specifics if you're going to ask for some more. And the buyer pays for that, or the seller. It's negotiable. Sometimes, if I'm not asking them to pay a whole lot of closing costs, I might ask the seller to pay for a home warranty. And the positive part of that is. If there's a concern with the water heater going out or something, my buyer pays the service call and it's replaced or it's fixed. It saves the seller from writing having an attorney draft a hundred and fifty dollar letter saying we're not at fault here. Top of the next page, title insurance standard coverage. That would be a seller expense because they have to guarantee that the property is free and clear of any liens by warranty deed. The way that we do that is through title insurance. Our company policies we require title insurance on all properties, even if it's cash, even if it's land, whatever it is. It's a way that we can prove that they have ownership and it's being transferred. It protects the buyer and the seller. Title insurance extended coverage, that's a buyer's expense because they've chosen to have a lien, a mortgage, a loan on the property. Additional title coverage and a buyer or seller if they choose to do so. Domestic well potability test. Now, there's two different things in market here. Who's going to order it? Who's paying for it? The check boxes on the outer part, portion are who's going to pay for it. The smaller ones are who's going to order it. I like to have the seller pay and order it because they know where it is, they can get it done. Especially if it's in the wintertime, they can find where it is and show it. So I'll mark that down to be a seller's expense and the seller to order it. Same thing with productivity. Same thing with the septic, pumping, and inspection. The survey typically is not applicable. Now, with these inspections being done, you're asking the seller to do them. Many times the seller might take their time to do it because they're waiting until closer to closing before they have that expense. If there's a problem, it makes it tough because your people, your buyers, have the time frame to inspect these things, but it was ordered by the other party, it didn't happen. Sometimes you might need more on that subject to inspection earlier to have a longer time frame just in case the seller doesn't get these things done. Occupancy buyer does or does not intend to occupy the property as their primary residence. Risk of loss or neglect. People ask me all the time, what if the property burns down or something? Well, then they have nothing to sell to you. Mm -hmm. What if I still want it? Well, then you can still do something with it. You might burn it down anyway. The seller needs to keep their insurance on the property. 
many times I've had sellers cancel it because, oh, I put on the market, so we stop making the mortgage payment, we stop doing all this stuff. That's not what happens. You have to remind your sellers. Walkthrough, there's two different inspections. The first walkthrough is for your inspection to say what needs to be done. And when they do that, they'll say, here's the repairs that need to be So once the repairs are done, they'll come back through and look at those items to make sure everything's taken care of. The second walkthrough is prior to closing. Approximately two days prior to closing, whatever you agree upon, we go through to make sure that it's in the same substantial condition that it was before. And in here, they modify the words. It says, it's the Walkthrough stated herein are not a contingency of the sale, which might allow termination, but rather for the buyer's satisfaction. The buyer's only recourse, if unsatisfied, is to notify the seller who must correct or rectify the situation. The seller shall make the property available for the walkthroughs and agrees to accept the responsibility and expense for making sure all the utilities are turned on for the walkthroughs except for phone, cable, and internet. The buyer does not conduct either of the walkthroughs. The buyer specifically releases the seller and brokers and their associates to any liability as to complete repairs and or changes or change condition. So that right there, the seller is required to have things turned on. The bad part is sometimes the seller, if it's a relocation company or the government or guard or something like that, they don't want to turn them on. So they may require you to turn them on and then winterize the place and then afterwards. That's not what the contract says, but that's how they're playing hardball. So you have to be careful. All right. And the other thing on here, if your buyers do not end up those walkthroughs, they're assuming responsibility. So just make sure that if you have a walkthrough and you have somebody do that, you should not be the one in. They should call us, oh, you go to the walkthrough for us. Well, then you're now just assuming that life. You say, well, no, who, who would you like to go? I'll, I'll get them in. You have a relative or somebody else or such and such to come through. You get somebody else to come through. And if they can't make it, you can your phone. You can use Duo or FaceTime or something to walk through so they can see stuff. And I was pressed to record about this. So I can record the walkthrough with you. They're also seeing the team. That way the responsibility is on you. You will be blamed for everything because people do not hold themselves accountable. Typically, they say it's somebody else's fault. And then you get yourself in court and say it wasn't my fault, it was their fault, but it still takes time and money. Singular and plural, foreclosure notice if the property's in foreclosure. We must talk about that in the RA continuous to be fixed up. Mechanics liens, sales price information. You'll get requests from people who say, I don't want this to go on the MLS. The buyers will say, this is going to affect my tax. No, you found the property through the MLS, and it's going to be reported through the MLS. Sales price is not confidential, confidential to the MLS, stated in the law. We are a private, we're a non disclosure state, meaning we don't have to report it for taxes and other things like that. But we can use it in our name. Transmission of documents, we can send them out electronically. If somebody needs to have them done or be done for emergency signatures, we can do that. Wire transfer warning, they'll wire stuff business days, it defines those, calendar days, attorney's fees, default. If the seller, the buyer defaults, the seller can take the earnest money as liquidated damages or sue the person. And the same thing is if the seller defaults, the buyer can do the same thing. Earnest money dispute, and we talked about that, counterparts. Have more than one copy of the different documents and put them together in the individual. Not applicable to find severability and potential severability of the other document. Representation confirmation. In your handout, I have examples of how to fill that out. You'll say, your office, the listing is with your company, and buyers such and such. It'll show you how to market this. You will never have a B and a C. You'll never have a C and a A, a B. Those type of things. So, you have to be careful. If you if you have a buyer representation agreement, it could be an A, it could be a B, it could be a C. So go through those different scenarios to help you mark those correctly. In doubt, call me on that. Closing, you put down the closing date, the closing company. This is the one that you typically encounter. So it says First American or whoever, the title company. So on the top page for the earnest money holder, you encounter. 
this part and we'll change that part as well. Uh, possession, typically marked upon closing. You might say at 10 a.m. Upon closing, because that's when the transfer of documents. I've had some people put down possession be July 1st, and the closing is going to be July 5th. Well, your people agreed to move out on July 1st so that they could move in. Maybe that wasn't your intent. Or the date is one thing, and they changed the contract to change the closing to another. So always make sure that you look at these things. Proration of possession, we can say proration. Upon closing, typically, sometimes you can do a different date on there. This fuel and the tank is going to be reimbursed, credited, assignment. And this form, this document will be assigned, meaning it's written up in my and Sue name, but I'm going to assign it to Fred John or Fred and somebody else later on. Can I assign it or not? If you don't address it, I know the law says you can assign it. Typically, it's great to mark on here, but you can if you're not. The entire agreement has the right to claim the rent in full times the yes, it's a disagreement. Of signatory. If you're saying you are an entity, you must prove that you have the right to sign on behalf of that. Acceptance, you're giving them a date and time to accept this offer. Now, on here, you put down 5 p.m. today, and they do not accept your offer until 5.05 p.m. today. You have to have proof of late acceptance, and I'll show you on the very next page how to do that. However, if it's a counter offer or they counter back, we don't use the late acceptance on the purchase and sell it. We now have a different document, so we utilize that other document. I'll go through that here. Okay, and then the last page. Signatures. Here you can mark down see attached buyers and endings or exhibits if you have any. Does your buyer can disclose if they hold an active item or a license if you're an agent? <clears throat> I'd have the buyer sign, print out their name, date, and time. But I would not have them fill out their phone number and other stuff. You know, I'll, I'll provide that to the title company so the title company can send them information. But I don't want the buyers and sellers to have each other's stuff and start contacting each other. Oh, I just want to show it to my friends. Come over. You know, these things happen. Seller signature. Signature subject to attach counter offer. They're not agreeing to this. Additional agendas or exhibits that they have, they hold an active real estate license in Idaho, or it's related to the agent. So if they agree to everything, no additional agendas or counter offers, but they sign it five minutes late, here at the very bottom of the form it says late acceptance. So the buyer's going to default to three calendar days, and the buyer can initial the date. If, however, they don't accept this and they do a counter offer, we will use the counter offer. Any questions on the RE21? Okay. Very well worked on that, actually. Okay. Now, there are the scenarios that you can go through that help you for this property and also write up offers. You can do those scenarios that you want to do. So, I highly recommend it. These are in all forms. You can write up submit them as a document, fill them out, and stuff. Addendum 1. You use addendums, this is today's date, and this is an addendum for purchase and sell agreement, or this could be an addendum for Article 10, this could be an addendum for the listing agreement, whatever. Agreement dated, and the ID number, address, buyer, sellers, and we'll put down what we agree upon. An addendum, there's addendums and amendments. But in Idaho, we just have this word, the addendum. An addendum is adding something to. Amendment is making a change up or change with. We just have the one point. We used to say amendment slash addendum, but now it's just amendment. So with that understanding, if you and the other party say, oh, we, we need to extend this because the loan isn't going to happen, everybody agree to that, we can extend it for a few more days? No. So then we fill out an addendum because everybody's planning for that change. Do they agree to it? If you don't fill out addendums if you're going back and forth, Wrote up an offer and say, Oh, I agree with everything but one thing. You don't do an addendum for that. That's a counter to it. Because you have to go back and forth. Addendums. Every addendum would be signed by all parties and agreed upon. The counters, you look at the very last counter of what was agreed upon. And you ignore the earlier counters. 
So if you ever have an addendum that somebody did wrong and you don't agree to it, you're going to have to agree to exclude it on the next addendum. So addendum two could say, addendum number one is no report. And everybody signs that. That way they can see why addendum one wasn't signed. Now, addendums change everything that was written beforehand. So if I fill out an addendum today, it could change the counteroffer that we agreed upon yesterday and the purchase and sell agreement that we agreed upon yesterday. So it's always nice on your addendums or counteroffers or on anything to progress. On the purchase and sell agreement, paragraph number five, lines 132 to 133, shall read the purchase price to be such and such. So it's kind of cut and paste. You take it from this addendum or counteroffer and put it there. That way they can see it and they understand what's being changed. Right? And everybody signs and dates that day. Addendums don't have a time frame that they're good because it's supposed to be something everybody's agreed to. Going to the counter offer form, however, a very different story. On a counter offer, you put down today's date. This is a counter offer to purchase and sell agreement dated such and such, address ID, buyer, seller. Write down this is a seller counter offer or this is a buyer counter offer. So typically the first one is going to be a seller counter offer coming back to the buyers. So you write up an offer. Seller disagrees, so it's going to be a seller counteroffer coming back to your buyers. You mark that. It says the undersigned buyer reserves the right to withdraw this offer at any time prior to the receipt of a true copy of a signed acceptance of this counteroffer within the time frame specified here. There's acceptance and delivery. If you ever get a signature on a document and it's 10 o'clock at night and it happens before midnight, need to let the other party know, I got it done, and I emailed it to you. Call me back if you don't get it. If they don't get it, they could say, hey, I don't have it. I never, I never knew. And they could accept another offer. So please make sure you always, I so it's too late, and I don't want to disrupt something. Time is of the essence. And you're supposed to have it by midnight. They're prepared to know by midnight. You get a hold of that agent. If you don't get it, you get voicemail, email, text, voicemail, everything that you can to show proof that you try to get that to them on time. And I like to put that on my voicemail, which I say copy it. If you don't get this, call me back. If you didn't get it, I, that way it's like, oh, well, you didn't call me back. I said such and such. Now, if we put down those different terms and things like that, there's a second counter offer. So your buyer's counter the seller. It goes back and forth several times, that's fine. But you don't say, I agree to everything on counter offer number one, but make this one change. No, you have to rewrite everything. It's as if counter offer one wasn't even there. Everything you write on counter offer number two goes back to the original purchase and sell agreement and any addendums that were signed prior to that counter. I had a very experienced agent the other day who didn't understand that that's how that worked. And they missed out because they thought something on counter offer one was still involved in counter offer number two. That's not the case. It says, to the extent the terms of this counter offer modify or conflict with any provisions of the purchase and sell agreement, including all prior addendums, the terms of this counter offer shall control. It doesn't say the previous counter offer. Because we have to have them acknowledge that they saw it. And they're not going to sign those other counter offers. So it's the last counter offer. Now, as an office, we're still going to ask you to turn in counter offer one and two to the three, so we can see you. But the last one is one that has to be signed. When you get flesh this out, so when you give us an example, say, what have you seen where multiple counter offers? Is it always the price, or is it? Well, a lot of times it's price. It could be repairs, it could be paying certain costs, it could be the date for closing, it could be what's included or excluded. So I might counter back on the first one as a seller and say, hey, I agree with everything you got there, but I'm not leaving my stove and my refrigerator. I'm planning to take those. And I really need to close on the 3rd of July because we have an offer on another property. And it would be more convenient to us if we closed at Rivera title instead of high near being put down. So the counter offer comes back and says, okay, I guess we can give up those two things, but we really need to close on such and such a date because that's important to us, and we're closing at Pioneer because I work there. So, you know, so then they'll be counter back again and say, well, we're okay with that part, you know, that you said, but you know, it's got to be so much more convenient. I don't care if you work there. I'm so it can go back several different times. 
I like to kind of float the balloon with the other agents. And I'll say, hey, this is what we're looking at. Even when I write up the offer, this is why we did what we did. So they understand, so I don't get counted back on something. I try to get that other agent to buy in a little bit or understand. So they're going to be explaining things to the other party and they understand the rationale of why. We've gotten away from presenting the offers to the other party in the past six, seven years. It used to be you always presented it to the seller. And you could ask questions and you could answer them. I think we're going to start going back to some of that because right now it shows up in your email that you've got a, an offer and no one even told you. You know, the other agent just emailed it to you. How am I supposed to know what to tell them? I don't check my email every single hour of the day. The weekends, I don't even look at my email. Okay? So it depends. But if, if you present the offer to the seller, that other agent has the opportunity to present that offer, the counter offer to your buyers. That's fine. So that's the counter offer. And on here now, it has a new date and time. So this is the date and time here that everybody needs to sign. People ask me, well, what if I have two sellers and one sign and not the other? Well, you try to get everybody out here, but it's understandable that maybe one of those two parties is out of town. One can, one can bind the people with that, but I'd really like to get that second one, but I would be okay if you have one or two signatures right now, and then the other person has a signature. But if you know for a fact that the other person said, I'm not going to sign it, then no, it's not going to deal. So try to get everybody's signatures on there. Okay, the next one is the RE10 inspection contingency. And on here, it's the same thing, but down the notice dated and all the other information up above is buyer's notice to the seller and seller's notice to the buyer. And it says this notice pertains to you mark the primary inspection or the secondary, or you can mark both. But remember, on the other one, we had three different things we would mark. We need to make sure that we either have one, two, or three RE10s that are Closing goes off. So if it's a primary inspection, you say everything's fine, great. Everybody signs it, we're done. They say, oh, we want the seller to do such and such, then we have to address that and get that solved. We agree to it, great. That one's done. Then we still have to worry about the secondary inspection. So we've got multiple time frames going back and forth. Now, don't assume that if they say items to be addressed on there and they want a credit, that things that they wrote down there are for the credit. Sometimes people write down they want a credit and they want the things to be Make sure you understand what it is you're agreeing to. If you're writing this up, make sure it's clear. You want the seller to reduce the price to such and such, and you don't have to say why. You can explain that, hey, we found these items that are wrong, so we're just going to ask you if the price can be reduced. Or if we're asking the seller to take care of these things, specify how you want it done. So you just say, fix the leak in the faucet, okay? You say, take one there, it's fixed. Well, that's not what I meant. I wanted you to replace it with this other super cool fancy thing, not just the little things up there. Right. You know, people's understanding is different. They just said to fix it, so I put a new washer in there. Well, that thing can be replaced with a whole new replacement. So whatever your expectations are, whatever it is that you want, be clear and concise. Okay. Now, if you do make a change on the price, that it's going to be reduced or you're going to increase the price, yes, you may have to do an addendum after this is signed. It just says, it says purchase price to be such and such. Because that's a document you give to your lender. Okay. RE10s you don't give to the lender. This is another agreement that's happening. You come up with the value for the property. And what makes you concerned because it's over oh, we're hiding something. The intent of the RE10 is not to go to the lender, it's to, for us to figure out what we're going to do with the home. I want to fix this, I want this, if I'm going to pay this price, this is what I'm expecting. The lender has their own inspections of what they're requiring to be done. Yeah. And the type of loan. So initials on the bottom of the page, and sign the last page. The RE20, Contract Termination and Release of Earnest Money. Form before this one, the previous RE20, had two sections on it, termination and the release of earnest money. And it was always assumed that when you filled it out, it was, we're terminating the contract if I get the earnest money, the way that you filled out the form. That's not how it read. It read the 
that all parties are terminating this contract, and this is the total of the universe. And the bottom part was instructing who gets the earnest money. So, whichever side I was representing, if they sent us a contract termination and they wanted earnest money, we disagreed with it. I said, sign the top part because they're not going to sue you because it says so. So, that wasn't the intent. So, we modified this. Here it says that we're going to terminate the contract, but we haven't agreed to who's getting the earnest money unless the bottom part's involved. And it talks about that earnest money is not going to be uh, their sole remedy. It doesn't have to be unless they agree to it. So we're going to terminate the contract. Everybody signs that. It dates it. It's terminated. They can relist it. Do whatever else they want to come back active on the market. But they may not have agreed about what happened, how it happened with earnest money. Or they can really release the earnest money. And we still think that the person should be involved in the transaction. It's going to be that way as well. And sign both with one. Is this something that gets ruled out? Like, if a company can come in and sit down inspection, that gets ruled out? The RE10 can count as a termination agreement, but the title companies prefer the RE20 because it instructs them. It says, holder, holder of it, at least this way. The other one just says it's going to get returned. Well, it's going to go out and maybe you make it as a whole buyer, as a one buyer, or what? Because on the RE20, you could say we want this to be terminated and we want it to be left there as a title company because we made an offer on the property. Or we're going to split it. 50% goes to the buyer, 50% goes to the seller. Or we're, the buyers are uh, separated. We want 250 to go to this person, 250 to go to this person. So the title company likes the RE20. RE27, seller's right to mark, continue to market the property. Put down the date, this is an addendum. So you can put down addendum number one. Now, if you have other addendums, just consecutively go through those numbers. One, two, three, four, five. This agreement provides for the seller to continue to market the property and accept other offers subject to the buyer's right to waive or remove the following contingency. Any waiver or removal of any contingency set forth in this addendum will be a waiver or removal of all contingencies in this addendum. Number one. Closing of 123 North Main Street on or before October 25th, listed with Fred Flintstone with ABC Realty. So you can put all that information down. Now, that means they have until the 25th or whatever date I just said, October, to continue to do this. If we get to that date, then we have to address it. Do we need to extend this or something? Because it's now past that date. Can be other. Continue to market the premises because it's subject to me getting my 401k released. And it could take a while. Or subject to me getting a settlement with, with the this medical treatment or something, the hospital. Whatever I have, I can have become contingency. So the seller can continue to market. Now, what happens when the seller gets another offer on the property that they want to accept? They feel good about it. Here, it goes on down and it talks about that, uh, well, first off, if they remove their contingency, they're promising they can remove it without having to meet that criteria. So if they say it's subject to the sell of the house, and they remove the contingency, it's not subject to the sell of the house. It's always tough because if they remove the to sell the house, they just don't have an offer on the house, it has to stay closed, so that's always been a tough thing. Additional non-refundable consideration. Here it says, if I remove my contingency, I will put down or non-refundable earnest money. I like the buyers to fill this out because if you're going to fill this form out, you're putting down the conditions that your buyer is willing to do. If you want to leave that blank, put down zero additional earnest money, that's protecting your buyer. So if you fill this out, you know the seller's make an offer subject to something, you know the seller's going to want to do this. It's better for you to fill it out on behalf of your buyer and get any counter coming back from the selling, from the agent working with the seller who's going to put Additional non-refundable consideration shall be deposited in the trust account within how many days of acceptance and by the removal of the contingencies. Failure to deliver the said additional consideration given with the written waiver or removal shall render such waiver or removal no void and it shall be deemed to be and treated as the buyer not to be contingencies. So if they don't get that other earnest money, 
business days, it defines those, contingency release clause. On here it says, once notice is given, the buyer shall have 72 hours to collect money to remove the contingency. So if you're working with the buyer, you want to have the 72 hours. If you're working with the seller, you might have 48 or 24. Everybody initials and dates that. Next page. To the extent this agenda modifies or changes anything, the same type of terms. So here the buyer and seller sign it. Now, if a note, if it comes in and you're going to relieve and you're going to give notice to that buyer that the clock started, all they do is they initial and date this and the seller signs it. We used to have on here that the buyer had to acknowledge getting it. Not anymore. The seller says, we're giving this notice and you give that to the other agent and you send it over to them and that starts the clock. The buyer then has the option to say, okay, we will remove or we will not remove our so that way we know if we can go through the transaction or not. Okay. The next form is the promissory note. I'm going to kind of skip over that because we don't use it very often. It's here in the packet. I'll explain you that if we need to. Then the RE41 agency representation disclosure. This form is used when you're doing a Fannie Mae or a HUD property or something where they have their own forms and they're not ours. The other party, HUD, will not sign it, but the Real Estate Commission says, okay, we've done everything that we can do. We put down who the con who parties are, and who's representing who, and who the responsible broker is. You need to have it signed by your buyer. So you have that complied. If an attorney drafts a contract, first off, I, as the broker, need to accept that contract. If I don't agree with it, then we can't participate in it. Because the law says that the broker must all forms that the licensee is using. So if you feel comfortable with those forms and I'm okay with it, it's missing some things typically, and this is the agency part, because it has to have those actual check boxes. That's what it has to have by state law. And it has to have a responsible broker name. If it doesn't have those things and that's the only thing that's missing, then we could use this as an addendum to that contract so it would fall. Okay. This is called the Home Warranty and Professional Inspection Notice. It helps us with our PO insurance to reduce the cost that we have. So we talk to the seller and the buyer in the same transaction and just let them know about the possibility to have a home warranty or to have a professional do an inspection. We have this selected, they don't have to do it, but they just have to acknowledge that they were talking about it. We have the buyer and seller in the same transaction, acknowledge this, and we get a reduction on our errors and insurance insurance. Conversation to have with your buyers and sellers. This is the receipt of earnest money form to be filled out if you're going to send it over to the title company with the earnest money. If you have a property, the buyer, sellers, this first one authorization number, the title company, the amount of the earnest money, the check number, and your agent name. Then you have that with the check, and the title company will come over and pick it up from our office. And then they would sign it, a date and time, so we know when it was given to. So that would be the forms. That's pretty much all of the, the forms from the buying side. Hope that this was beneficial for you. We have the handout to help explain certain things for you, but always remember you can call me if you have questions. 208 234 help. Okay. Any questions?